Hello and welcome to the show. Now, when it's come to our hill climb builds, there were various rules in which the cars followed. Specifically, they were having to use their standard engines and standard drive lines, unless you know the PI didn't allow, it, which was quite rare considering these cars were built to A class. The reason is simply for the sake of variety. It is very easy to swap engines, very easy to make cars all-wheel drive. And, well, for the sake of some interest, and to use some different combinations, different engines and so on, and to not have everything just be all-wheel drive swapped with the 6.2 V8, I made it a rule not to swap the engines out. However, I was curious to know how some vehicles would fare if they broke these rules. So I decided to go and have a try with a variety of cars. The Jaguar E-Type was one such vehicle that disappointed a bit when run in its normal configuration. The E-Type Jag has been very, very fast in previous build series as a race car in general. You really can't go wrong with this. However, when it was run within the set of rules that we had, it really struggled. It was a long, long way down. It's probably one of the slowest rear-wheel drive cars outside of the really stupid stuff that went up. It was one of the slower cars to tackle the course. So, what would happen if we took the engine out, made it all-wheel drive? Now, ideally, of course, I ordered the V8 in this. The 6.2 V8 that we get to play around with on Horizon 4 is a very, very strong engine. It's very good for PI, very good for the amount of performance you get from it and so on. Unfortunately, I couldn't get race tyres on the Jag, which we know are almost fundamental to running up this course, uh, V8 and all-wheel drive in one go. So I instead went for the 3.2 litre i6. Still not a bad engine. Not a bad engine whatsoever, uh, because I was suspecting that the Jag's standard engine just wasn't quite up to the task of getting up this hill climb stage as quickly. And, well, the all-wheel drive was to kind of help with traction. I hadn't expected all-wheel drive to be quite so important up here. Sure, off the line it's going to help, but most of the cars were at low speeds around here, and a lot of them very grippy. I had expected rear-wheel drive to work, although, as we'd seen, a lot of vehicles all-wheel drive was proving helpful. And when it came to... Well, converting this Jag, if you like, it was pretty damn good. It was pretty damn good with the engine swap with the all-wheel drive. It was still a touch understeering at the end of the day. These conversions don't change. Well, the front tyres are ideally like to be larger, and of course, we're still working with a very classic car. Yes, I've got race suspension on it and so on, but, you know, at the end of the day, it is, <laughs> it is still a classic vehicle. So it wasn't the absolute greatest of handling, but it is, you know, we're talking... 300 odd horsepower, nearly 400 horsepower in fact, in a car that's very light at 2,300 pounds, which means when you put that all together, you have the traction from the all-wheel drive, a slightly more energetic engine. It can go very fast indeed, a 125.7 for the E-Type that puts it into 13th place. The original time was a 28.4. That's a big jump up for the E-Type. That is a humongous jump up through the order for <laughs> for the Jag. It was 59th uh, with the normal rules of the engine swapped, the drive line swapped. We go up to 13th place. It beats the Cayenne. You know, we're talking amongst some very very fast vehicles indeed. So, in the case of the E-Type, it did make a world of difference. Now, the next vehicle that I was going to have a go with, I wanted to try sort of a variety of different cars. The Volvo 850R went up the course. Went up the course relatively early on. In the series, it was it wasn't a terrible vehicle to drive by any stretch of the imagination. It just wasn't a massively massively fast one. It certainly wasn't challenging for top honors amongst the front wheel drive cars. So again, we would take the vehicle, rebuild it. The engine would be swapped out for a turbo rally unit. Uh, while the Volvo engine not particularly bad at all, the turbo rally engine is an interesting one. To, to work around with. Um, this way was a pretty much completely stock turbo rally engine, so we're talking just under uh, 330 horsepower, 360 or torque. It's heavier than the Jag at near 3,000 pounds, but we have got that all-wheel drive traction. Now, the difficulty, of course, with front-wheel drive to all-wheel drive conversions is the cars are inherently... They are, they are inherently set up to be front-wheel drive. Now, front-wheel drive to all-wheel drive isn't too bad uh, because of the traction with all the wheels being driven front wheel drive to rear wheel drive can get a little bit funky from time to time uh, the volvo again after this conversion certainly was not a, a bad vehicle to drive i didn't have any of the oversteery issues that you can sometimes get with these conversions i think helped by the car well having a much longer wheelbase than your traditional front wheel drive conversions that you may have done 
And, I mean, it's a, at the end of the day, it's A-Class with full-on race tyres and a full-on race build, so it isn't likely to be quite as twitchy as some, because everything has gone into the handling department. Uh, it's not the fastest, even with this conversion, it's not the fastest through the corners. Much like we had with the E-Type, it's still limited on tyres. The tyres on this are not particularly big. I think they're two four fives all around here, which, compared to some of the vehicles that have run up here, they are <laughs> pretty... Uh, pretty pretty tiny at the end of the day, but likewise, certainly wasn't a bad vehicle to drive up here. You have, I mean, taken away a lot of the characteristics of the Volvo when you do this, which is why I was leaving them with their standard stuff. Uh, but it was going to be another vehicle that would go faster. A 126.8 for the Volvo. Now, it isn't quite as dramatic a gain as the as the E-Type. In fact, the, the Volvo was the one that was one place above the E-Type with the original one. But it is still a big jump up through the leaderboard. It goes into a 36th position. That 26.8 puts it around the AMC Javelin Clio OS. It's actually not that much faster than the Cadillac Limo. So, while the conversions will make a car a bit faster so far up the mountain... It isn't a cure-all for everything. You can't make a car that was struggling up this course suddenly miraculously go very fast. What happens, though, if you take a car that was fast? The Honda Civic RS, uh, the fastest front-wheel drive vehicle that ran up the course, courtesy of it being incredibly light and massive tyres. Because of the wide body kit option you get on this, you can get two 7.5s on it. On a car this small and this light, that gives it an immense amount of grip. So what happens when you make the car all-wheel drive and give it a... well, it's another Honda engine. It's one of the two-litre uh, Honda engines that went into it. The engine conversion was perhaps not the most significant part uh, with this car. Again, the standard engine wasn't a bit that felt as much as it let it down, but... Generally speaking, the more modern engines are a little bit, uh, a little bit faster, a little bit more uh, say easy to drive, easy to extract performance out on these, on or certainly on this sort of a stage. Now, the Civic, one of the reasons I said why it's so fast, it weighs less, even with all-wheel drive, the Civic weighs less than one thousand five hundred pounds. That is incredibly, incredibly light. It's the same sort of weight, roughly, it's a bit lighter than the 340R that leads the way. It has bigger tyres than the 340R all around, and importantly, it's got those tyres at the front, because that's what's going to be controlling the turning, and turning is so, so important around here. As you can see from some of the mid-corner speeds this car could have achieved, it was fast. It was very fast up here, and unlike when the Civic was front-wheel drive, now I can, you know, you can put your foot down coming out of a corner, Nothing you can get, no understeer. There's not enough power to really spin all four wheels because it's only got, it's just over 200 horsepower, only 133 torque in this car. It's not particularly powerful, but it doesn't need to be. It was a similar story with the Lotus. When it ran up this course, it didn't have a huge amount of power, but it was so very light and could use that power very well. I mean, this thing was getting up to speeds that most cars weren't able to do. Hell, it was faster through some sections here in terms of acceleration than some of the S1 class cars, the stock vehicles that were running up here, because it is so, so fast getting going out of the slow corners. And yeah, we have a new fastest time for an A-class car, a 123.4. Yes, the Civic converted to all-wheel drive with a slightly different Honda engine, actually is faster than the 340R, only by a couple of tenths of a second, but that added all-wheel drive traction getting it out of the corners was, uh, well, was it was was ample. It, as I said, it was very fast at standard, the 26.4 uh, standard, or well, standard following the, the original rules going up that course, but uh, yeah, there was a rather profound effect on the, on the Civic. I wasn't so surprised, perhaps, by that sort of, that sort of difference because of what that car was to begin with. Now, up until this point, I had been using cars that had either struggled a little bit or vehicles that had been very fast. So, what if I was to take something a little bit more middle of the roadish? The Mercury Coupe, certainly not a bad car when it came to running up the hill climb stage within the normal rules, but what if we were to give this the same treatment? Car converted to all-wheel drive, given the 6.2 litre V8, Mercury starts off as a pretty sensible, I say a pretty sensible vehicle. Yes, it's a very old car. However, you get some massive, massive tyres at the back of it, which gives it 
plenty of traction, even though it is rear-wheel drive. So, when you stick the all-wheel drive in there, uh, it's I expect it to be better, but perhaps not, again, not be crazy, not a huge, ridiculous increase, although, again, we've got an engine improvement power-wise. We're talking 431 horsepower. It's not exactly a light car. It's heavier than the Volvo 3,200 pounds, although some vehicles seem to make do with B. I still don't know how the Quartz Regalia got as fast as it did. I, I'm still bemused by that car. Yes, it has decent-sized tyres and all, but, I mean, the Mercury's certainly the back are the same. The front aren't as big, no, but even the SUVs were nowhere near as close to the Quartz, and some of those had similar size tyres, so some of them were lighter, actually, than the Quartz as well. The Regalia is still a little bit of a mystery to me. However, the, <laughs> the hope was, the theory was, with the Mercury, uh, it was a pretty, you know, a, a pretty a pretty solid vehicle to start with, perhaps with this engine that, you know, is lighter and generally better in terms of the power delivery than the standard one. Uh, give it the all-wheel drive traction, because even, you know, with the big tyres, when you put your foot down in the Mercury, you could still get it sliding, you could still waste time slightly. This all-wheel drive system, you know, you know when it's got this size tyres with all-wheel drive, it's not going to be doing anything. In terms of wheel speed, it will always be using that power, so I was hoping for something half-decent out of the Mercury. It's still a little bit of an understeery car, uh, to say, <laughs> say the least. It is still, still going to be a little bit patient uh, around the corners. You can't throw it around like you could with the Civic. The time is fast, though. The time is the time is quicker, 124.9 for the, for the Coupe. So, again, it is a... An improvement. I was going to say a marked improvement. Uh, the standard car was fairly fairly decent, a 26.4, and with the upgrades, it actually goes up into the top 10 now. I go into a ninth place with that uh, 24.9. Beats the Sunbeam. Uh, it just fractionally loses out to the Evo 6 and the Polaris. So, yeah, it was an improvement. It was definitely an improvement. Going again, another one <laughs> with all the conversion work done. It was the faster way. However, it wasn't up there challenging with the Lotus. Now, this did get me pondering something. Was it perhaps more the driveline uh, rather than the engine that was the straight-up thing? So up until now, we've been converting the vehicles with everything. You know, with that engine and that driveline and so on. But what if I was to take a vehicle and just focus on the all-wheel drive versus the rear-wheel drive? So, I've taken something that's not particularly suited to this course. Now, do not get me wrong, I love the Dodge Daytona very much indeed. However, it is a very long car. It's quite a heavy car. And it isn't really the idea. It's not the first vehicle you think of where you go, yes, I want to take a car up a narrow, winding mountain pass. So, I was going to build the car to A-Class using the standard engine, but changing the driveline. Up first, we were going to be having a go with the rear-wheel drive one. Now, as rear-wheel drive, the vehicle is going to get a little bit more power in it. I mean, both the cars are very powerful at the end of the day. As rear-wheel drive, we're at 450 horsepower, 500 torque, 3,500 pounds. Now, I picked a muscle car specifically because of the giant rear tyres that they get. Because, well, if you've got a car with two four fives and some 300 horsepower, you're probably going to be sliding the rear around. While this is a powerful vehicle and everything, when you start getting up to the three four fives and whatnot, even here, yes, there is a little bit of over, little bit of oversteer as you can actually see through that particular corner we get is <laughs> sliding around. You know, it stands the most chance of being able to deploy that power through the rear wheels. And I like the Daytona, and I want an excuse to drive another muscle car, pretty much. Uh, fitted on the race tyres. You know, it's certainly not too bad through all of these. Well, you can see the mid-quarter speed there. We're not quite up towards the mid-90s that we see some cars accelerating up that hill. As I said, I'm not expecting this to be getting close to the likes of that Civic RS and the 340R and whatnot. But it could certainly hold its own up this course. It certainly wasn't slow at all going up around this circuit. You had to be aware, you know, it, it did feel like a bigger, felt like a heavier car. And there wasn't the same, again, much as with the, the well, Mercury in some ways, but you certainly can't chuck this car around quite as much. It isn't a bad, it's not a bad handling vehicle up here. It uh, does struggle a little bit for pace overall. I expected it to struggle. It doesn't feel like it's struggling when you drive. It's, it's a weird thing. It's kind of a difficult thing to explain in some ways. Uh, it doesn't actually really feel like it's going slowly up the mountain. However, it overall is not the fastest. A 127.2 was the time set by the 
by the Daytona. Now, as a rear-wheel drive car, that'll put it into 42nd place. Actually, a fairly average position for that sort of a car. It's a couple of tenths down on the 68 Ford Mustang. It beats the uh, 72 Falcon. So it's in kind of good company. It actually loses out to the Cadillac limo. Uh, but it's kind of around about where you would expect to see the Daytona. And that is following the builds as it would have done. Standard engine, standard driveline, has race tyres on it. You know, what you would expect. So, what if we were to go for the all-wheel drive swap? Now, this is, again, keeping with the standard engine. You could probably just about get the 6.2 into this, um, I had a quick check before running it, it's about 5 PI into S1 class, and you could probably fiddle around with bits to drop the PI down if if you were desperate to pinch and so on, but for the sake of this, as I said, not going to mess around with the engine conversions. Uh, as an all-wheel drive car, the, the weight does shoot up a little bit, 3,700 pounds, which that's a lot of weight actually going up this course. Uh, 432 horsepower, sorry, just under 500 torque. It is, yeah, a smidge less powerful. About 20 less torque, about 20 less horsepower. It's about 10 less horsepower, in fact. Uh, so it's a little bit down on power, a little bit more, a little bit more weight. But you have the traction getting out of the corners, which is good. You have a little advantage getting off of the line, but with the big tyres it wasn't exactly like oversteer was the primary concern yes you could excite the car into wheel spin you could excite the car going sideways but it, when driving it it didn't feel like oversteer was the primary concern i felt like i just couldn't carry the speed the clutch didn't have the grip through the corners as an all-wheel drive vehicle certainly there was no excitable sliding from the daytona there was still a little bit of understeer was still struggling a bit to get the vehicle turned into into the corners uh, again it felt pretty decent to drive up here if again again a tad on the heavier side as we run up towards and across the finish line it is quicker i'm not so surprised by it being quicker it's not quicker by a massive massive margin 126.4 for the vehicle it does go into a 30th place it actually goes uh, very very similar to the Mercury Coupe, it just loses out to the Lamborghini Miura and the Civic RS. We are eight tenths of a second faster than the date with the rear-wheel drive Daytona that we run. And interestingly, that's one of the smallest gaps we saw between vehicles. All of the other rule breakers that we ran up here with the engines and driveline swaps were, well, some of them up to three seconds faster. So, yeah, I think. All-wheel drive, I say sadly, I, I didn't quite expect when I started this series, but certainly all-wheel drive was an advantage when it came to the hill climb stage. Perhaps not quite as big of an advantage as it might initially have looked. On some cars it can work absolute wonders, things like this Civic RS, uh, when, you know, you make that all-wheel drive when it's as light as it is. That's an absolute little rocket ship when it comes to this sort of thing. Uh, it isn't a, it isn't a cure-all uh, if we were using these. It wouldn't have had, you know, wouldn't have had all of the cars that broke these rules, wouldn't go to the top of the leaderboard. A car that struggled up this course, no matter what you did to it in a it was probably going to struggle a little bit. There were ways to make it go faster. Certainly some of the engine swaps uh, were, I think, in some ways more important than the actual uh, drive line. Certainly with the likes of the E-Type, I think the standard engine in that E-Type really struggled to, uh, to make the car work. But yeah, everything did go faster when, <laughs> when, when we broke the rules and bent the rules a little bit in this one. I mean, as I said at the start, the point was to see how the original stuff goes, because yes, you often will find yourself swapping drive lines, putting cars uh, with different engines, and so on, which is why we did make the rules. Uh, but there were some interesting results in this one, and the Civic is incredible. It won't work at every circuit, no, of course not. Anything with long straights, it might come a little bit undone, but... That Civic is a little monster when it comes to the tight and twisty stuff in A-Class. I am... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Impressed with the vehicle managing to beat the 340R and everything. That, though, is going to be it for this video. Thank you all very much for watching, and until next time, a goodbye.